right. If someone could go ahead and put in the chat whether or not they can, you can hear me just fine. And if you're seeing my screen, just to make sure so that I don't get behind here. All right, can see in here. Thank you, Stacy or Leslie. I'm not sure which Stacy that is. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, good afternoon. I, it's, it was good to chat with several of you before we got started with this online enrichment. Um, and I, so I'm, what I'm going to do is kind of a multi-part presentation. And I'm going to start with what I was doing when many of you last saw me and then move on into what I've been doing the past five years and then into what I've recently started working on after graduation. Let me get where it needs to be. All right. So. I'm going to start by looking several years in the past. Um, for those of you who've been volunteering at Litzinger for about four years or less, um, you may not be aware that I actually worked as a restoration ecologist there at Litzinger Road Ecology Center for about seven or eight years. And so and in that, my role there, I guided the interns each summer in their research and restoration projects. Um, I worked with Mary and James Traeger and several others to make sure that uh, we had burns that were carried out safely every year. Um, I facilitated outside researchers who studied ecosystems and wildlife at Litzinger. Um, I led volunteers on invasive species removal, uh, planting projects, water quality monitoring. And it was that water quality monitoring that eventually drew me away from Litzinger. Um, because one winter, the volunteers and I started to find very high chloride concentrations in the tr in the stream. Um, and not that wasn't just at Lipsinger, but at sites all along Deer Creek. And then um, I reached out to several other volunteers that, who do water monitoring at other places across St. Louis. And they were also finding high chloride at sites all over St. Louis. And so that brings me into the part two of this uh, presentation, um, or two of, of my past, what I've been doing. So when I left Litzinger, I started working on a PhD at St. Louis University, looking at how road salt is impacting stream life and what we can do about it. So why road salt? Well, if you haven't guessed already, we'll get there in a minute. All right, so first, a little background. Um, the use of road salt to improve the safety of travel following winter snow and ice storms is a relatively re recent phenomenon, first gaining traction in the 1940s. Since that time, this practice has gradually spread into most parts of the world where snow falls. The use of salt in the United States now exceeds 20 million tons per winter, and the purchase price for that, to buy that salt for cities in bulk is about $50 a ton. So that means we're putting about $1 billion annually as an, as an investment in salt for safe transportation. But there's several negative consequences to using road salt. The first of these is that salt is corrosive to both concrete and metal. Um, according to a study from 1992, that one ton of salt that costs $50 can do $600 in damage to infrastructure. So that means that we're causing around $12 billion in damage to roads and bridges in the United States each and every year. Uh, so that's just roads and bridges. It does not include damage to cars and other, other types of vehicles. Um, so it's a very limited amount of, of, of the damage that's being done just from that one ton of salt. And there's several other negative consequences. Um, for some reason, my no, slides aren't moving the same as the rest. Okay, so um, so we put the road salt down on our sidewalks and on our our other types of pavement on you know parking lots, roads, and then the salt dissolves into the snow melt. So the salty water can travel from paved surfaces like sidewalks, parking lots, roads into areas that have vegetation. Salt at these concentrated levels is toxic to many plants, including grass, as you can see in these pictures, as well as street trees. And it's also of concern in plant-based stormwater solutions like rain gardens. And so we have that salty runoff goes down through the grass, and in this case, into a storm drain. 
And those storm drains transport that salty runoff into nearby streams. So these are all freshwater streams. And the animals living there have adapted to living in freshwater conditions. Yet every winter, aquatic life is exposed to highly concentrated salt from runoff, potentially creating toxic conditions. And the salt doesn't end up just in the streams. It can migrate also into groundwater. And both surface water and groundwater serve as drinking water supplies. So the increase in salt in these areas raises concerns about the drinkability of water, especially for those that have underlying health conditions like heart disease. Now, we don't have much to worry about this locally with our drinking water, but this is a real problem in parts of New York and other places in New England. So that's a little background on why road salt is of concern to many people. And before working or moving into the work that I've been doing, I wanted to give you a few relevant numbers to keep in mind. Um, the natural chloride concentrations in streams are generally less than 40 milligrams per liter. And there are certainly exceptions to this that depend on the geology of the area. So the state of Missouri has set a uh, chronic threshold for aquatic life of 230 milligrams per liter. That's the amount of chloride that's considered safe for aquatic life to be exposed to for about a four day period. Um, and then the acute standard that they've set is 860 milligrams per liter. So that's how much exposure they can tolerate for about one hour. And then the chloride concentration that you find in seawater is about 20,000 milligrams per liter. All right, so now we get back to how this fits into my leaving Litzinger. So this project began with the help of 36 trained monitors with the Missouri Stream Team program, including volunteers at Litzinger, who've monitored chloride in the winter at 63 sites in St. Louis County. Uh, they've taken nearly 3,000 grab samples since we started in, 19, or in, in uh, 2012. And after we'd been collecting these data for a couple of years, I approached groups like the DNR and MSD to see what we could do. Long story short, they weren't gonna do anything. Um, not necessarily because they didn't want to, but just a bunch of regulatory and, and bureaucracy things that aren't really relevant here. Um, so the volunteers doubled down on their collecting and I started a PhD. So on this map, we see a summary of the maximum chloride concentrations that the volunteers found at their sites across St. Louis. The sites that are in blue stayed below the chronic level. Uh, the sites in light blue went above the chronic level, but below the acute toxicity threshold. And then all of the sites in yellow, orange, and red had maximum concentrations that were higher than the acute toxicity threshold to varying degrees. And you can see that as we move away from downtown, we move further out to the west, uh, we get, you know, we move from areas of mostly red and orange into areas with more blue and yellow. Now these are grab samples, and that means that each sample is giving us a snapshot of water quality at a single point in time. So some of these represent the maximum of only five grab samples, and others represent over 120 samples. So I always like to remind people that we have to take this data with a grain of salt. I know, I know it's a bad joke, let's move <laughs> on. <laughs> All right, um, so based on the volunteer data from the previous slide, I selected 15 of these streams that showed a range of maximum chloride concentrations, as well as a range of um, the percent of winter samples that were above the acute or chronic toxicity thresholds. So the really good sites and the really bad sites and a bunch of sites in between. Um, and so on the map, you see the sites and their watersheds. Uh, the background color indicates the level of urban development with high density development in dark gray and non-urban land uses in white. So uh, the aquatic invertebrates were collected and sorted into taxonomic groups like mayflies and caddisflies and sow bugs. Um, and then the richness or the number of types of organisms at this level was used as the first biological measure. Um, and then members of the, the, caddis, or the mayfly group were then further identified to genus and I had specific counts on how many animals were at each location. So mayfly diversity was calculated and used as a second biological measure. 
Um, I also used data loggers in the stream to record conductivity at 15 minute intervals for two winters. There's a, a well-established linear relationship, um, a constant relationship between conductivity and chloride um, that allowed me to use that conductivity data to make a chloride data set. So these data were summarized using six what are called chloride metrics, and I'll talk more about those in a minute. Um, <clears throat> and then in order to identify non-chloride factors that might also impact the invertebrates that live at these sites, I made measurements of several habitat and landscape level factors. Um, so I used five me measures of in-stream habitat, looking at canopy cover, uh, the amount of the stream bed that was covered with algae, the percent of the stream bed as sand plus silt, uh, the percent of the stream bed that was cobble, and the percent embeddedness of the substrate, which basically tells us how much how much is settling from the water column onto the the rocks of the stream bed and possibly smothering some of the habitats. Uh, then there were three landscape variables that I looked at, um, watershed area, the percent of impervious surface in the watershed, and impervious surface is basically anything water can't infiltrate into, and then the percent of roadway in the watershed. All right, so based on, my, sorry, my computer is acting up a little bit. I'm gonna, actually, I will take this as a possible pause to look at any, if there's any questions here yet. I can find my, here we go. Okay, no questions yet, yay. <laughs> Okay, so this is, um, wanted to put a picture up here. This is some of the equipment that I used to collect the samples. This is what I used to collect the invertebrates. A um, little bit different than the stream team equipment that you might have seen before. Okay, and then this is the, the data loggers. Um, so these little, little instruments here are the data loggers. And then this is the tube. I would put them in to keep them protected from the environment. And you can see I'm pointing right there to, to where I had one of the data loggers in a place where it's, it's kind of tucked behind some rocks to keep it protected from Jumping. debris flying in the stream, floating down, downstream as, as time went on. All right. So. These are box plots, and these summarize that 15-minute chloride data over the two winters that, I, that the study was going on. Um, the, the tall, thin lines represent the full range of the data that was collected. And then those blue boxes near the bottom are the interquartile range, or the middle half of the data. So the, the quarter of the data is on the top, a quarter is on the bottom, and then that, that's the middle half. Um, the horizontal black line in the blue box is what's called the median or the, the middle value. So again, half of the data is above the black line and half of the data is below the black line. Now note that several of these sites have maximum concentrations approaching 8,000 milligrams per liter and that one site even had a concentration over 25,000. So more salty than what you find in the ocean. Um, but beyond those maximums, there's those two horizontal lines at the bottom, the red one and the yellow one, and those are those acute and chronic toxicity thresholds set by the state of Missouri. Um, and all of the sites did go above the chronic toxicity threshold, uh, but there's three of them here. Button here. Um, these three, these two here and this site here, they were only above that uh, chronic toxicity threshold for short periods of time, and then they never went above the acute toxicity. So those are kind of the, the best condition, and then the, uh, the site here being worst condition. <clears throat> all right, and so I have all of, all of this data, all of these numbers, 15 minute intervals, so thousands of data points. How do you compare chloride in streams like that? What's the best measurement to use? 
So rather than just select a single measure, as I kind of mentioned before, I included six different measurements for chloride. Uh, the first was the maximum concentration, so the, the peak value shown at the very top. The med median concentration, that black bar in the middle of, or, or somewhere inside the blue box. The total duration of concentrations above the chronic threshold. So how much time did it spend above that yellow line? Uh, the total duration of concentrations above the acute toxic threshold. So for three of those sites, those were, that was zero because it never got above 860. But then for the other sites, it was you know, some period of time that was above that, that acute threshold. And then also the maximum continuous durations of chloride above each threshold. So, you know, it may, a site may have had a total of 20 days above the chronic toxicity threshold but maybe the longest single interval was only one day and otherwise it was just very brief spikes. So for that case, it would be 20 days would be the total duration and the maximum duration would be one day. So these six measurements are going to be related to each other. And so and mathematically, statistically, having too many um, variables that are closely related to each other is called over-parameterization, and that's definitely a science no-no. Um, so I use something called a principal component analysis, or PCA, to reduce those six measurements into two things, two numbers that can account for more of the variability. And in this case, um, I found two PC axes, and those accounted for 90% of the variance, or the relationships among those six measurements. So the first PC axis there on the bottom predominantly identifies locations that just have high or low chloride value. Um, places with high concentrations are over here on the right, and the lower concentrations are on the left. So these are our three sites that had pretty low throughout. This was our site that had 25,000. Um, and then the second PC axis over um, the, the vertical axis looks at uh, differences between locations where the chloride concentrations had high maximum concentrations and more frequent concentrations above the acute standard versus those sites that have a greater tendency to exceed the chronic standard and have a higher median concentration. And so that kind of shows up here. These three are the maximum chloride and the duration of, of concentrations above the chronic threshold or the acute threshold and this is the chronic threshold and the median value. So you can see that those error arrows are pointing in the direction where those are, are the more dominant factors. All right. So as I mentioned, I collected aquatic invertebrates. Um, and in these 15 streams, I was able to find organisms that I sorted into 31 taxonomic groups. So these images show representatives of nine of those groups. And then the presence or absence of each group was determined based on all of the samples collected at a given site. So the total richness at a single site ranged between 12 and 26 taxa. Now most of these are only identified to order or family. And so one of my future projects is to identify more of these um, groups of animals to the more specific genus and species level so that I can do some better analysis with the data. But one group that I was able to identify to genus was the mayflies. Um, so there's three different families that I found. Um, the first of those is family Canidae. There were only 20 of them in all, and they were all in one genus. Um, these are teeny tiny. Um, the, the black line on here is a thin Sharpie marker. Um, and so we have this little animal here, and you can kind of see um, it, we're kind of near the back legs. I'm, I'm just the the part at the edge, the back edge of the uh, of the circle. That is the indicator of what this is. Or actually, it's probably a little easier to see on this more zoomed-in image. So those gill covers are unique to this group of animals. Um, so the those large gills cover the other ones um, at least a good portion of the way down the back. You won't notice that on the other pictures that I'll be showing you here in a moment, but that's how you identify that group of animals. Um, 
Oh, and look, I put a circle on there. I'd forgotten about that. All right. Um, so the next group is a family called Heptogeneity. These are the flathead mayflies. Um, you can identify this family based on the wide flat heads that they have. Um, and they also have their upper legs are broad and they have flattened bodies overall. Um, and there's two different types of flathead mayflies that we found. Um, and, and this is actually the se second image I put up is both of the different um, different species that I found. Uh, one of them is Stenonema femoratum and the other is Stenacron. Um, and if this is too much detail for you, you can blame Bob Beerag because I was talking about this with him and he was very fascinated. So he so I thought maybe you would be too. Um, and so the way that you can tell that I can tell these apart, let's see. Oh, yep is if you look a little closer at their back. At the, this is one of those rare instances where, where using the color patterns on the bodies actually makes a difference. Um, normally, you don't trust to do that. But you can see that on this guy, it has these kind of black stripes between each body segment, those stripes there. And on this one, you have like dots and dashes and kind of going between each body segment. That's one of the, the major keys to be able to tell those apart. All right, so we have the third group is called the family Beta D, and these are called minnow mayflies. And I had over 6,500 of these to look at. Um, and in order to get them accurately to genus, you have to look pretty closely. So we're gonna look a little more closely at these here. Um, so the first thing that we start by looking at is the gills. You can see that, uh, I mean, it may not show up wonderfully, but the, the one that has the circle higher up, that gill is fairly rounded. The other one, the gills are much more pointed, especially that, that last gill. Um, so that's the first thing we look at. But then we also look at the mouth parts. And in this case, what we're looking for, again, zoom in a little bit, is this little notch right here in the middle. That's how we can tell that, that's one of the, the factors we look at in trying to get down, not, not even to species, just to get these to genus. You have to be able to look that closely. All right. And anything, and I can do all that still with just the regular, um, the same microscope I've been using for all of the rest of this, was looking, which was looking at about an 8 to 10x magnification. Anything beyond that requires mounting heads and legs on slides and looking at 40x magnification or higher. Um, so one thing that we do is looking at the legs, uh, we look at special tiny hairs that are called villipore. And you can just kind of make it out in this picture. If you look, you have kind of right in the middle, there's that area that looks a little fuzzy. That's because of those little hairs called villipore. So what it can do is zoom that in for you. And uh, this is looking at, at that part of the leg under 100x magnification. So just look for those tiny little hairs and that's how you can tell. Another thing you can do is looking at the claws, um, looking at the length of the claw relative to the length of the first major leg segment. And that one somehow is not a very good characteristic because there's a lot of them where the claw length is rather than longer or shorter than half of the length of the leg segment. It is half, and it doesn't tell you which way to go when you're in the key for that. So that was always a lot. So claw length segment, but then also the amount of hairiness of the legs. And so in this one, we have one that has quite a few kind of scattered hairs across the leg in this, and then in this one, particularly in this part of the leg, they're very fairly evenly spaced, even length, um, just kind of cleaner looking in general. And so that's two different, um, two different species there. And then we get into the mouth parts. So for this part, um, it wasn't just looking for a little notch. I actually had to kind of push down on the heads and crush them a little bit to make sure that the mouth parts would all come out, come out and be visible. And so I had to look at the shape of a mouth part called the labial palp. And there's three different shapes all shown here. Um, this first one, and just in case it didn't pop up, so it's this part up here. Um, 
So that is the, a truncated shape. And then this next one, I would say, is a mitten shaped. And then this last one, it's this part, and that I, I just make up the name for it. So I'm calling that Betus because that's what that, that genus is called Betus. Um, that's what most of what I found looked like. All right, so all in all, I ended up identifying individuals from those three families, and within that, there were seven different genera or genus. Um, and notably, more than 7,000 individuals were identified, and over 96% of them were in that, that betas group, that last one that I talked about. So all of these, um, again, up to almost 3,000 at an individual site. All right, and I see a question from Susan asking if all of the sites are different creeks or if there were different sites in the same creek. So all of them were different creeks, um, and there was only one pair of sites where they were in the same network. Um, so actually one of the sites is just a little bit upstream of the Litzinger Road Ecology Center, up at the, the Log Cabin Road Bridge, so maybe a half mile upstream uh, from Litzinger on Deer Creek. And then there was one other site that's further upstream than that, um, and that's up in Monsanto Sunswept Creek, which is near Chaminade High School, kind of in that area. Um, so those are the only two that one of them, that they would have even an upstream-downstream relationship. Um, all of the rest of them were different branches in the network of streams that make up the streams of St. Louis area. Um, and some of them fed up north into um, the Missouri River, some of them go directly into the Mississippi, and others go into the Merrimack. So we had a, a range of different watersheds represented. Right. So once all of that identification was done, I created what are called predictive models that uh, for both the, the general taxa richness and the mayfly diversity, so those, those two biological metrics that I was using, biological measurements. Um, and so I, I came up with those models using 10 environmental variables. Um, this was accomplished using something called model selection. If you want to know more about what that is and how it works, just let me know and I'll, I'd be glad to talk with you, but I figure most people would probably either fall asleep or, or want to log off the computer if I started talking statistics too fast. All right. So looking first at the tax of richness, so broadly speaking, how much was living there um, or how many different things were living there. Um, I found that there was a positive relationship with both the watershed area and with that second principal component axis. And that's the one that, um, that talked about uh, the axis, about the type of exposure, not just the concentration. Um, so, so basically, looking at the watershed area connection, um, the further you go downstream, the, there's generally a wider variety of habitat and food resources available, and that can support additional taxes. So the relationship between richness and watershed area is not really a surprise. Um, but the influence of that second PC axis, the, the duration is what I called it, um, it suggests that the type of exposure to increased chloride matters. Um, the positive relationship indicates that exposures with a longer duration of exposure to concentrations at the chronic level, they, they have a greater number of species than the sites that have a greater maximum exposure or a greater acute exposure. So this suggests that events categorized as acutely toxic um, may have a greater impact on taxa richness than just having a long-term low level of toxic exposure. Um, and now moving on to mayfly diversity, um, what we found was a negative relationship with the first principal component axis and also with the percent of algae cover. So positive relationship means that, that when, for example, from taxa richness, when the watershed area goes up, richness goes up. That's a positive relationship. Um, with mayfly diversity, we're looking at negative relationships. So as the percent algae cover goes down, the mayfly diversity goes up. 
so they have opposite direction that they that they go. Um, so the negative relationship of mayfly diversity um, with algae cover um, has a lot to do with with the fact that there are mayflies there. Um, the types of mayflies that were found in these streams all feed as what are called collector gatherers or scrapers. And that means that the algae will be a dominant component of their diet. So this probably contributes to the relationship. Like the more mayflies you have, the less algae that is left that they haven't been munching on yet. Um, and then the negative uh, relationship of diversity with concentration. Um, as the concentration of chloride increases, then you have a decrease in the concentration or in the, the number and diversity of mayflies. So that's kind of a look at what the high salt use in winter is doing to streams. Uh, but now that we have this information, what can we do about it? So salt accumulation in streams is a problem that needs to be solved through resource management and stormwater management. Um, a lot of stormwater management is done using solutions like rain gardens and stormwater detention basins, which are designed to allow stormwater to filter through the soil or through some soil-like spongy medium. That water is then uh, then enters into the groundwater or into stormwater systems, and that that works really well for a lot of pollutants like nutrients and sediment. Um, those are very effectively removed in this process. But most of the salt remains dissolved and passes through these filters. So the only truly effective way to decrease the winter salt load to streams is to decrease the amount of salt we put on the roads in the winter. So I wanted to study a method that some of the cities have been using to cut their salt pipes, and that's the application of salt brine. So what is brine? Um, brine is basically just salt water. And the practice of brining involves taking the same solid rock salt that's been normally used on the roads and dissolving it in water to create a 23% solution. And then they spray that solution on the road before the storm hits. So there's several benefits potentially of using brining. Um, it can be done up to two days before a forecasted storm, and that allows road crews to apply it during regular business hours and cuts down on overtime costs and means that they don't have to come in at two in the morning to put the salt down. Uh, and then according to several studies conducted on highways, you get the same road clearing effect and it can be achieved using half or less the amount of salt. And so that would reduce a lot of the negative consequences that I mentioned kind of in that introduction as far as the, the, you know, the problems that you get from using salt. Now, there's also potential drawbacks to the use of brine, particularly in places like St. Louis, where it's difficult to predict the form that a winter storm might take. Um, often a storm will begin as rain and then transition into snow or ice. And under these circumstances, if brine has already been applied, the rain is going to wash it from the pavement. And then road crews will still need to return and spread the rock salt as well. And this would overall increase the amount of salt that's used. So several um, studies have been done in the past looking at, um, at brine on highways or you know, very small studies in parking lots, but no, none of the studies have included real world applications of brine for storms in residential areas or the use of best management practice in multiple municipalities. So for my project, I studied three pairs of cities. Um, each pair was selected using uh, to include one city that already had a brining system, and those are the cities in dark blue, and then one city that did not have a brining system, and those are in light blue. So those pairs were set up as neighboring cities to try to control as much as possible for the variability of storms as they come across the St. Louis area, and they were also selected to try to minimize the social and economic differences between them. Um, socioeconomic factors like city revenue, um, per capita household income, and density of development might impact salt use generally within city limits due to things like the city's salt budget, the residents' expectations for what their road, how clear the roads should be, and then the likelihood of residents to use salt on their own private driveways and sidewalks. And so again, went back to using that PCA, and um, in order to confirm that socioeconomic similarity, um, I looked at 13 demographic, economic, and land use metrics or measurements. Um, I included the six study cities and then added in three other non-study cities from St. Louis County 
has a similar a similar size as an out group. Um, and using this method, we found that our paired cities are more like the, um, their partnered cities than they are other cities or nearby cities. Oh, and got another question from Susan. Um, is brining only effective before the storm starts? Um, generally, that's when it's used. It is possible in some, in some places, in some regions of the country, they apply brine kind of at mid or tail end of the storm as well, um, just because they, they don't, they know that there's only a certain amount coming and that, uh, that the brine will take care of what's, what's still coming. But in St. Louis, I've never seen people, I've never seen any cities put brine down other than to take care of that first part of the storm. All right. All right, so for two winters, I had some data loggers, kind of the same ones as before, and I put them um, into stormwater pipes to record conductivity, which again gets converted into chloride and then water pressure readings at five minute intervals in four stormwater pipes in each of the six cities. So a total of 24 locations. Um, the pressure logger was used to estimate the water depth, which was then combined with the pipe diameter and pipe slope to estimate the flow volume coming from an individual um, stormwater pipe. And then the chloride concentrations were incorporated to determine the chloride load at each five minute time point, and then a chloride yield. And that was done for nine different storm events over the two winters of the study. Uh, I also identified the drainage area for each pipe using topography and then maps of the stormwater system provided from MSD. Um, and then the road area within each of these, what I call pipe sheds, uh, was extracted. And then the chloride yields were evaluated as grams of chloride per square meter of road on a per storm basis. Hopefully that's clear. All right, so before I give you the actual results, I wanna guide you through what you're going to see here. So on both of the axes of this graph, I'm showing the yield of salt, the amount of salt conveyed during a storm event, as I mentioned, measured in grams of chloride per square meter of road. So on the x-axis, or the, the bottom axis, we have the, the salt from the city that has brining. And on the y-axis, or the vertical axis, uh, we have the salt used during the same storm event from a paired city that does not have brine. So every point you're going to see on this figure represents one pair of cities for one storm event. Any point that falls in the region above that one-to-one -one line, that in anywhere that in this figure is blue. Um, that represents a pair in which for that storm, the city that uses only rock salt used more salt than the city that uses brine. Any point that shows up on the one-to-one -one line is a storm for which both cities used about the same amount of rock salt, or the amount of salt overall, the rock salt or the brine. And then any point below the line is a pair in which the brining city actually ended up using more salt than its paired city that has just the solid rock salt. And so what we find from this figure is that most of the points are above that one-to-one -one line, and there is a strong relationship between the paired cities and their salt use. So on average, the cities that had the brining technology used 45% less salt. So what does this mean to you and me and the critters in the streams? Well, to find out, let's do a little visualization. Imagine a residential street in, in your area, probably about seven meters wide. And I want you to imagine just a one meter stretch of that road. What we're gonna do is take one of these containers of salt and sprinkle it over this short stretch of road. And then do that four more times. This is the amount of salt that the brining cities did not put on the roads that their neighboring communities did use during these nine storms over the course of two years. So that represents a savings of about 1.5 tons of salt per lane mile per year. 
Um, and I just want to clarify. So a lane mile is one mile of a one lane road. So most residential streets are two lanes. And so a mile of residential street would actually be two lane miles. All right, so according to um, F FHA, the Highway Administration data for the state of Missouri, there are nearly 48,000 lane miles of urban roads that are classified as what are called minor arterial collector and local streets. So urban streets that aren't highway level. Um, and the use of brining on those streets could cut salt use by 71,000 tons per year in the cities of Missouri. So this would save about $50 per ton in purchasing and $600 in infrastructure damage for a grand total of $46 million per year on urban streets of our state. I think that's a pretty impressive saving. Um, now, most things that save money and keep infrastructure in good condition are also bad for the environment, but this will be different. Let's look at, at this from the environmental perspective. All right, so uh, we're, we're gonna imagine one of these little kiddie pools. I'm also gonna see if I can make my slides forward on my computer like they do. Okay, so we got one of these kiddie pools. We're gonna fill it with eight inches of water, and then we're gonna do the same thing seven more times. First, I'm gonna get this back there. Okay, seven more times. Now, now my slides are showing up like this. All right. Um, we're going to sprinkle this container of salt into those um, kiddie pools of water. With a concentration of 230 milligrams per liter, that uh, chronic toxic toxicity threshold, all of that water, 800 gallons, is now toxic to aquatic life. But that's just from one salt container. And for that, that little one meter stretch of road, we had five of them. So... Now we need 40 kiddie pools just for this stretch of road for nine storms over two winters. It's about 4,000 gallons of water that's protected by switching to brining. And so converting that into that lane mile basis, that would be the equivalent of filling. Now my slides are, some are moving forward and some are not. Oh, this is just not working happily at the moment. All right. So that would be the equivalent to filling about 2.4 Olympic swimming pools or not quite 10 Washington monuments with, uh, with salt or with water that is toxic to aquatic life. Every year from every lane mile of road. So again, if we multiply this by the lane miles of streets in the urban parts of Missouri, we get about 77 billion, with a B, gallons per year. So that's the equivalent of a cube of water covering the area of 25 football fields with contaminated water one mile deep every year from the urban areas of Missouri. Okay, so that's what I've been doing for a lot of the past decade um, between Litzinger and, and the PhD work. I recently defended my dissertation, and so now you can call me Dr. Hake if you'd like, but you don't have to. Um, I also recently started a new job, actually less than two weeks ago. Um, so I'm the new director of the Illinois River Watch Program slash stream ecologist at the National Great Rivers Research and Education Center, which is located in Alton, Illinois. Um, and while it's in Alton, Illinois, I'm still working from home because COVID. Um, so this is a picture of my brand new flash future workplace, once we're all allowed to go back in. Um, that's the Mississippi River there in the background. And that building has a lovely green roof that is full of plants. Um, the trees are actually taller than they were when this picture was taken, they have a beautiful persimmon tree out front, and I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Um, so River Watch, which is kind of where my main focus is going to be, you know, the director of the River Watch program, 
Um, it's a statewide water monitoring program that's similar to the Missouri Stream Team, but it has a much stronger focus just on the stream invertebrate um, program and less focus on the chemistry and the litter pickups. Um, so we're currently in the process of hiring a part-time assistant for the program. So if you know of anybody who might be interested, um, please have them apply because I think we're actually getting ready to start interviewing soon for that. Um, and then as I mentioned in this position, I'm also a stream ecology. So I will be continuing my work, uh, my research, and hopefully that will mostly take the form, at least for now, of identifying more of those animals, like I mentioned before. Uh, but I'm also um, talking with, with um, a few collaborators or potential collaborators about getting started on a microplastics monitoring program that might include both Missouri and Illinois. So we'll, we'll see what happens there. Um, and that's really all I've got. So if you have questions, um, then either put them in the chat box or I'm okay if, if we want to, if people want to take turns and actually voice their questions, that's good too. Okay, I'm just going to go through starting at the top of the chat box and make sure I didn't miss any. Come on, introduce the bathroom. direction. I parked this way so I don't have to. Said some of us came for the stats. I, I will gladly talk stats with 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 you if, if that's an area that you're interested. <laughs> um, okay, how long? Cindy asks, how long does brine remain effective with rain, ice, snow, and traffic? And does temperature affect it? Um, temperature affects all of the different um, chemicals that are put on the roads for um, salting, and that's actually one of the reasons that that different places will use different chemicals as they go along. Um, so road salt uh, that we typically think of is sodium chloride, um, same as table salt, which is why I use that um, table salt in the in the kind of thought process there. Um, and that stops working. Uh, it, well, it decreases effectiveness around 18 degrees, and then um, becomes kind of not a great product to use once you get to like 10 degrees or below, if I remember correctly. Um, so at that point, the people, they start switching to things like calcium chloride and some other salts. Um, but there, there are different products that are used at different temperatures. So that's part of the question. Um, the brine, often they, they put it down about, you know, like, as I mentioned, up to two days before a storm. And the reason that it's not longer than two days is that as cars roll over it, um, it can be kind of knocked off of the pavement slowly. And so um, ideally, it's really within 24 hours of the storm. Um, and then what it does is rather than, like when you put the rock salt down, the rock salt actually, um, it melts, it, it, it tries to break down the barriers or break, break down the connection of the ice and snow with the pavement. But having the salt on the pavement acts as a barrier and keeps it from bonding in the first place, which is one of the reasons that we can use less salt for this. Um, and so that's it's more effective that way. Um, but then and it, it will melt usually if it's snow, it's about the first inch of snow. And then whatever volume wise is equivalent for the ice. Um, so, you know, maybe a quarter inch of ice, something like that. That's that's about what you can get out of the brining. Let's see. Um, Jim Jordan then asks if um, no, I should have listened to that versus NACL. I'm um, out. Enrichment. So calcium chloride and NAC and sodium chloride are both used. Um, I think calcium chloride is considered more toxic, partly because it takes two chlorides for one calcium, whereas sodium it's it's an even split. It's one calcium and one sodium. I mean, one sodium and one chloride. Um, and so, but the calcium may also have something to do with the toxicity. I'm not 100% sure on that. All right, so Adam asks if any work is being done to determine the environmental cost of mining all of that salt. Um, someone may be doing that sort of work, um, I, but I'm, I'm not aware of it. 
Let's see. All right, and others others are just comments, and I appreciate your your comments, and I'm glad that I was able to to visit with everyone today. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen, and then I'll actually be able to see you again. And I went ahead and unmuted people <coughs> unless they muted themselves. So. <laughs> All right, any other questions? All good. All right. Thank you, Dr. Haig. Yes, oh, thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> Can we all come visit you at your new workplace? Uh, eventually, yeah, once the state of Illinois is not on a stay-at-home order, then <laughs> I'm hopeful, yeah. Uh, although there's, uh, so the, NGREC, which is our abbreviation for it, is actually kind of like Litzinger is operated by the Garden. NGREC is operated by Lewis and Clark Community College. So kind of whatever their college mm. proclamations for when things can be open is what we kind of have to live by. So yeah. and I was able to actually visit there a couple of years ago on one of the um, education retreats. It's a oh, nice. Place. Yeah. It's it's beautiful and I like part of me is glad I get to work from home because it's a 45 minute commute. <laughs> but, but I, you know, it is going to be a great place to work and like this is the perfect time of year to be there. So I'm a little disappointed that I don't get to go out there just yet, but I'll be happy whenever we can get out though. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Great to again. Thank you. Great to see so many faces. <laughs> Look, yeah. Harvard didn't want to leave. Neither does <laughs> <laughs> Maryland. It's really nice to see you all. Yeah. It's nice to see you guys. <laughs> I do like they're all waiting to see if they're all waiting to see if there's some kind of gossip that's gonna come. <laughs> I do like spending time with me, myself, and I. We haven't gotten in any trouble yet, but <laughs> but you never know. <laughs> this was good. Very good. Great. Do we have a date for the next enrichment that's supposed to happen, or is it still? I don't know. Leslie left the call, so. Uh oh. Well, okay. <laughs> she. I think she was saying something about Colleen Crank in a week or two. Yeah. In yeah. May. Yeah. I don't know exactly the exact date, but yeah, I think maybe not next week, but the week after. But they're going to send out an email with the information. Oh. It's so funny. Mark Flanders is still his his video is still there, but I don't see Mark. <laughs> and it's still sideways. Yeah. Yep. You He's okay? Lying, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, good to see you, Danielle. Thank you. It's Thank good you. to see you too. You. All right. Thank you all for tuning Bye -bye. in. Okay. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.
Good. Yeah. Oh, wait. oh, that's good. Yeah, you're good. Too far. Too far. Pull up a little bit. Go on. Yards really nice. Oh, yeah, this is really nice. Dang.